Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome back. It is time again for another edition of the Weekly Member Spotlight. I am very excited to sit down today with Mr. Charles Tassel, who is the Director of Government Affairs for the GCNKAA. We are going to talk to Charles a little bit about himself, his experience in the business, and as a surprise, Charles, I'm going to grill you a little bit on some hot happening government issues going on in our industry. So you're going to want to um, stay till the end of this interview. We've got some, um, I think, helpful information that we're going to ask Charles to uh, maybe give us some insight on. So before we get started, I always like to let everyone know about what's going on in the association. And if you do not have your summer scheduled out, we've got something every month coming up for you. So June 13th is our golf outing. June 19th is the next gen event. It's gonna be a really cool event. It's a cookout at the monastery, the guest house actually next door to the monastery. So you're gonna to wanna to get registered for that. It's a free event sponsored by our next gen committee. Um, and that's gonna be really fun. July 12th is the B&B Riverboat event. So limited seating on that. Please get registered if you can. And then August 13th, our business exchange event. We're gonna have a lot more information coming out very soon about that event. So without further ado, Charles, I wanna spend as much time as possible with you. Um, I know, again, I mentioned you're the Director of Government Affairs for the GCNKAA, so you're a very familiar face. I think most of us read your article first in the newsletter that comes out because it's always chocked full of exciting and very relative information. And then you're also a managing men member with Cornerstone Redevelopment. Uh, probably a few other things you'd like to share with us. Why don't I stop talking and ask you to maybe introduce yourself? Well, we've got 190 units at okay. Cornerstone Redevelopment. We started about, uh, what, seven, eight years ago, uh, kind of in the recession and started purchasing going up. Okay. Um, and from there, we've grown, sold a few, bought a few, and we're sitting there now enjoying the market and enjoying the industry. Right. Um, it's, it's a little bit different than a lot of my colleagues who are doing government affairs across the country because mm -hmm. they do only the government affairs. I'm also a member, so right. it's, it's a different perspective. So how did you get involved originally with the apartment association? Um, actually, I was working at Cincinnati City Hall mm -hmm. and working as a staffer for one of the council members. Mm -hmm. Actually, had switched council members, worked for a couple of council members, which was unusual, and then found out that there was an opening and for a full-time position. Okay. So I reached out to uh, Mark Franks and said, hey, I'm interested in this position and started to say, we started to discuss it, we went through it, and he said, we have an idea, we're not sure what we wanna do with this position. I said, I have a few ideas on that, let's let's try this. Okay. So, February of 99, I started the association. Wonderful, that was gonna be my next question. How long have you been in the industry? Well, you've been around quite some time then. I'm sure you've seen your fair share of wild and crazy things. Do you have a memorable story that you'd like to share with us about your time in the industry? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, we, we talked about being a member and actually, I go back to about 2005, and actually riding to Columbus with Bruce Forrester and Cindy Minks, and Bruce made a comment. He said, Charles, when are you gonna become a member? I mean, when are you gonna start buying in the industry? And I said, what are you talking about? All I would see is, you know, I called them the flyers. I called them because somebody had an issue, and I called them to handle right. it or address it, calm it down. And he said, you know, we do make money in this industry. <laughs> so, nobody's told me about that part of it. All right. <laughs> and so we started talking about that, and he and Cindy, schooled me quite a bit uh, just on that trip and I very much remember that trip yeah um, and that really kind of started laying the groundwork as I put my team together and prepared for starting the purchase and going forward from there what do you enjoy so much about being involved in both your legislative role representative um, and right. being an owner well it, it, it's interesting because to a degree I'm a policy wonk mm -hmm. I try not to do get too wonkish on people right but I do enjoy the policy side of things and the, the spectrum of issues you'll deal with, um, whether it's a mold issue one day, an ADA issue the next day, somebody's dealing with construction and permitting on one side um, in, in Kentucky, the next day it's something in Ohio where we're dealing with a, a tax issue and you have to understand the finance side of it. Mm -hmm. There's just a, a breadth of a spectrum in the industry that from the housing to construction to relationships and the reality is you're dealing with folks and partnerships and companies and you've got to keep good relations with all of them okay. and, and understand where they're coming from and why. Sure. And that's that's part of what I enjoy. It's a challenge. Okay. Well, um, with your experience, what advice would you offer up to folks who are just starting to get involved with the Apartment Association? Well, I mentioned the word relationships. Yep. That is the most important. Um, develop those relationships, get involved, whether mm -hmm. it's on committees or getting to know people and calling people up on a regular basis and say, hey, can we go grab lunch? Right. Can we 
grab breakfast, can I just chat with you a little bit? What's your experience? Tell me a little bit about it. Right. Um, and, and that that more than anything else will you'll start building an understanding of the industry because there's a breadth to it that takes a while to learn. Right. It absolutely does. And it takes a while to kind of foster those relationships too. So I think that's really great advice. All right, well, can we shift gears and learn a little bit more about you kind of outside of the business? Sure. All right. Um, so one of the things I, I didn't really go into it, so I'm also a council member in the city of Deer Park. Okay. I've been doing that since 2012. I was uh -huh. appointed. Um, run several times and won and re-election there. Mm -hmm. and again, policy, I enjoy that. Right. Um, and then also I am the, I'm an elder at my church, which is Pleasant Ridge Baptist Church. Okay. I've been there for about, about 26 years, 25 years oh, as wow. well. Okay. Um, Married for 27 years. We have three kids. Okay. Uh, one's hopefully graduating college next year. Oh, wow. Uh, another one's actually finishing her sophomore year in high school. Okay. And one just finished fifth grade. Oh, wow. So we have quite the spectrum. Quite the spectrum, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and lots of driving experiences right now. So that's oh, wow. Um, Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your nerves a little <laughs> on edge. <laughs> yeah, and, and hers too. So. Right. Well, I was going to ask you um, about your family. Do y'all have any pets at home? Yeah, we have a dog and a cat. Mm -hmm. and I, comment that the cat has a spirit of a dog in it. It's been raised by a dog and thinks it's a dog and That's it runs with the dog all back and forth. So right. What are their names? I always love learning our pet's names. Um, the cat's name is Gandalf the Gray and White. Okay. And, which beat his original name as a stray, which was Chubbers, because he's, he's large. <laughs> right. Uh, he's a 20-pound cat. Oh, so, my. Yeah. Um, and then Coco is our dog. She is a boxer shepherd mix. Okay. And she's about 45 pounds. Too smart. Yeah. Um, and pretty well behaved at this point, which, yeah. is, which is good. She's about a year and a half old. Okay. Well, what do you like to do in your pastime? Um, a variety of things. We catch up with friends. We play card games, board games, mm -hmm. different games. I, I computer game a little bit to the side just to kind of, when I need to, okay. Enough, a lot of time? Enough, yeah, a little, a little quiet time by right. myself. That's my that, or, or do some reading. Okay. So. Uh, speaking of reading, have you read any great books lately? Um, I. I read the Bible every day, so that's yep. one side of it. Yep. Um, one of my favorite books is actually uh, the Thirty Six Chinese Stratagems, okay. um, which talks about strategy and how to approach looking at different scenarios. And it, I enjoy that. I've gone back to that book repeatedly. Oh wow! I'm going to put that on my list. I'm always yeah. every time I talk to someone, I find a new book to add to my list. So I like doing that. Um, oh, are you into TVs or movies? And if so, what's one of your favorite TV shows or movies? I don't watch much TV. Yeah. Some movies, it depends. I, I like, you know, they're, they're a little stranger, but like uh, something like Hellboy, because it asks the question, what does it mean to be a man? Right. What does it mean to be a person and define yourself? And are you more than just the subject or the matter of your surroundings? Right. I like that. So you get into the deep movies, meaningful okay. movies. My, my degree was in philosophy, in fact, <laughs> one religion. Uh oh, so we could talk all day then, huh? Yeah, the, the, the question they always say there's two things you never talk about, you know, policy, politics, and religion. That's well, right. That's what I. That's all you on. want to talk about, right? <laughs> that's <what I'm... laughs> We're friends on Facebook. I can see your posts, and yes. I see that about you. Yeah. Um, what's one of your favorite foods or local restaurants? Uh, actually, it was just closed. Uh, Campanello's downtown. Oh, mm -hmm. um, well, Lanyon is fantastic, and people say, "Oh, it's you know your wife and your grandmother's wedding." I'm like, no. I told them all <laughs> their lasagna was better, right. and now they've gone out of business. Oh, so no. did you I'm get looking for? Did you have time to get one last meal in there? I found I had eaten there the week before, and then found out it closed right oh. the next week. I was like, oh no, so, yeah, that's disappointing. Um, well, I don't have any recommendations, but if any of our friends watching has any good Italian restaurants to share, that's it. That's we'll ha we'll ask them to hit you up and shoot you That'd a message. Um, what about sports? Are you a sports fan? And if so, who do you follow? Not really a sports fan. Yeah. Um, I do pay attention. I was involved with the stadium campaign. I knew, worked on that some. Right. Um, but not really that involved with anything sports. Got it. Being from Cincinnati, you know, you're a fair weather fan or? <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, my wife is a dedicated fan, Reds, Bengals, yes. hardcore. Yes. Um, so yeah, I have my memorabilia and I, there you I go. wear it and attend regularly. But. There you go. Um, what about music? Any good concerts lately or any concerts planned for this summer? Um, actually, we had a different type of concert. It's actually we're going to go see Tim Allen. At oh, the end of June. Be okay. The comedian side. Of yeah. Going, Where is he? Uh, he's Coming? actually he's actually going to be in Cincinnati, I think, uh, June 23rd or oh, something. Oh, okay. Like that. Yeah. And then... Uh, I've heard his comedy is a little off-color, not quite as uh, clean as his character he's known for. 
Uh, I hope not. <laughs> I think I think that's what I've heard. Okay, well it'll be I'll be interested. You'll have to check the PG or yeah, PG thirteen rating there. Out. Exactly. We, um, did, we did go see a concert uh, about a year ago with okay. saw Bon Jovi. Oh wow! That yeah. was up in Columbus. That was fantastic. Oh, I bet. That was a great concert. Love me some eighties and nineties Bon Jovi. That's exactly it. That's awesome. Um, well, share something a random fun fact about you that we wouldn't otherwise know. I have no idea. Oh, <laughs> so it's like, yeah, kind of cover the spectrum. Um, any designations that we haven't talked about or any special awards or recognition, well, anything like that? You know, dealing with the press a lot mm -hmm. and being out front, people a lot of times assume that I'm an attorney. Right. So a lot of times I qualify. I, I play an attorney on the radio or on television. <laughs> I'm not actually an attorney. I thought you were, actually. I have, I, I have several that I call on, uh, Jeff Greenberger being yeah, one of them, yeah. I call on a regular basis. Um, but that is one area where I always have to qualify. I'm not an attorney, right? And but having worked with legislation and the law and policy so much, um, it's interesting. I actually get phone calls from law firms or work with legislators quite a bit on what do you think about this policy? Uh -huh. And that's fun, and I, I enjoy that side of it, right. helping to create and, and, and tweak and improve it. Um, well, you had me fooled, Charles. So uh, <laughs> one of them if this director of government affairs thing doesn't work out for you, just <laughs> go sit for the bar exam. <laughs> We talked about that. It was right. an interesting concept, but no. um, actually working on an issue called suspended driver's licenses. Mm -hmm. um, I, my son makes a comment. He says, "Dad being bored is not a good thing." Right. So I have a couple of nonprofits from Street Rescue, which gets community guns off the streets, mm -hmm. um, to have a, a new um, foundation, uh, Civic Foundation for the Tassel Foundation for Civic Engagement, okay. uh, which will give scholarships, um, kind of like Jesse Brewer does as well. Yeah something like that and then the new one I'm working on is suspended driver's license uh -huh. we've had contractors who you know, they get in a situation where they're making paycheck to paycheck right and then they cannot you know they get they can't make $25 insurance payment right and then they get pulled over right and their license is suspended mm -hmm. thousand dollars in fines mm -hmm. and it's this downward spiral and they can never get out of it right so how do we help create a situation that creates success or allows for success rather than puts obstacles in people's right. way so that was uh, one of the interesting things I've been kind of working on as a little side project. Okay, see, very random fun fact. I like that. Um, well, if you don't mind, I would love yeah. to shift gears a little bit since you are our Director of Government Affairs, and I know it's always, um, I think, great to have a, a resource like this to talk. I know from my perspective, being an operator of you know, a management company, there's so many things going on right now in our industry, legislative yeah. issues and things that are kind of um, in the forefront, there's a couple of things that I know uh, my company and, and my colleagues have been um, kind of just grappling with and, and trying to understand, one of which is the criminal background check slash fair housing challenge. Um, and the other one is the city of Cincinnati's um, position on short-term rental housing. Mm -hmm. And then I would just ask if there's anything else going on that you want to give us a heads up on or kind of share. Would love to hear your perspective on that, those things. Well, it, it's interesting because all of those are kind of tied into the affordability aspect. And affordability has become, as, as occupancy rates have climbed, uh -huh. which has been great for the industry, and right. we love it, right. but then it starts to hit, okay, what's the cost? Right. And is there an impact? And if you look back during the recession, there are a lot of C properties and, and some Ds mm -hmm. that were taken out, and it's glad the Ds are gone, those, right. need to be, those structures need to be redone, right. or just re redeveloped entirely. Right. But what happens is there's now a shrinkage in the market, and so what we're looking at is affordability starts to become a question. Now, in Cincinnati, affordability is a whole different issue than it is in the coast. Sure. So each market is wholly different. Mm -hmm. And the problem is some of the arguments are being overlapped. So they'll come back and say, well, you have to have a $55,000 income in order to get a one-bedroom apartment. It's like right. um, a one-bedroom apartment you can find for $350, $450 in Cincinnati. Right. And not even in a necessarily a bad neighborhood per se. Right. Not that any neighborhood is bad. Right. <laughs> but you know, but even look at that, you can say that's it doesn't cost that much. You, you don't have to make that much money to get that. Right. And it's, it's very obtainable housing. Sure. Um, so, but part of that is there's two sides to it. One is advocates are looking at both how people come into apartments. So the the ban the box issue is one of the pieces of that, saying, well, we don't want anybody looking at if somebody's got a criminal background. Uh huh. And it's like, well, walk that through. That means that if you're living there already, that means that the property owner can't stop somebody coming in 
who has a criminal background uh -huh. to live next to you. Right. Is that really what you want? And right. people start to go, no, that's not what I want. Um, and they want to know that side of the behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And especially when we're held liable, if there's a criminal aspect going on, if there's criminality that we should have known about, right. Right. and now we're being told you can't look at it. That's a problem. Can I ask just for my own edification, who's challenging that standard, which is a standard for most professional management companies to um, run a criminal background? Like who's challenging um, the right to do that? And where does it stand right now? Well, there's a couple of groups. There's a Housing First uh -huh. group that's out there and their focus is, look, get somebody in housing because housing's a right. Uh -huh. And that's really what's behind it is housing is a right. And that means you get housing no matter what, uh -huh. whether you pay for it, whether you maintain it, whether you comply with the rules or the laws, you get housing. And people go, oh, that sounds nice, until you have to live next to it, right. or you have to maintain the house right. that somebody is living in. And I say house, but the apartment building sure. or the efficiency. Right. And that becomes a real problem. Um, it, it, again, they're nice concepts, uh -huh. and it does not function well, it does not work well. A lot of what I deal with is are unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And these kind of concepts, as far as policy, have a whole lot of unintended consequences that are just damaging to not only society, but to individuals and the property rights across the board. Right. So do you see there being a federally mandated change to that concept of, of having the right as a landlord to pull a criminal background? At this point, it has not. Okay. Um, I know it's a discussion item and it'll be a discussion item in each new administration that comes in. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's, everything is up for reinterpretation, as they sure. say. Whether it's the affirmatively furthering fair housing aspect that uh, Secretary Carson has said that he's going to uh, look at reinterpreting mm -hmm. to, because that was really a federal control of all municipal zoning uh -huh. at the start. I mean, it, it took over uh, every local level and the local and put my council member hat on Suddenly, if I'm not in compliance with what the feds want, the feds get to take over my city. Right. Wait a second here. When did the feds get to, you know, that we have this whole checks and balance system that, right. that just throws it all Right. If I can use that technical yeah. <laughs> So, you know, there's, there's that side of it. But then when we come back to even this, you know, there's the book you evicted out there, uh -huh. um, that which was, is really story written form of documentary. And ignore the drugs, ignore the bad behavior, Ignore the fact that somebody's not going to work or not going to pay for the property or their, their, their home or their unit. Now they've got to, oh, they sh we should all give them an apartment anyways. And it's like, you just ignored all the problems and there's no consequence for anything. Mm -hmm. But that book has kind of set a tone. So what happens is not only is there the limitations on the ban the box on them coming in, there's the, the exit side, which is where people are really looking at evictions. What does it look like for evictions? And it's, that's kind of what's actually brought up the short-term rental side of things. Uh -huh. Because people said, well, how long are these people in here for? How are you getting them out? They said, oh no, this is just a short-term rental. Well, it's a rental. Right. What, and, and trying to redefine that. Again, it's a disruptor coming into the community, so you've got to figure out new policy for it. Right. And keeping it separate from long-term rentals, uh -huh. um, the over 30-day rental, which is what we have, right. and separating those pieces out. Because the next thing somebody says is, well, we need to inspect those. And I would suggest to you that no building inspector can do nearly as well as somebody coming through who stays there and lives there and gives it a three, four, five, or a one, right. which, you know, a one kills that that place. So they're gonna make sure they take care of it and make sure that they maintain them. And that's the aspect that's just ignored by the municipality and the bureaucracy who has to justify their own existence. Right. So they want to be there and they no, justify the battle. That's it. So you know, it, it's really working through that. And then, like I said, coming on the backside is there's a variety of kind of eviction issues mm -hmm. from saying, well, if they give you any money whatsoever, you have to take it. Mm -hmm. And that means they get to extend their stay. Right. And most landlords who are working with people on a paycheck to paycheck basis are already comfortable with, okay, yeah, you, I, I saw your car broke down. Yeah, right. let's, let's work through this. And they're working through it so that by the time they get to a point where they're like, I'm done, they've either been lied to or they're several months behind and being lied to. Right. And that's when they say, I'm done. And being forced by a law, if they come in with $10, that's another day. Yeah. And they come in with another $10, that's another day. I mean, the nightmare of the paperwork. No municipality would put up with that, right. but they expect us to put up with right. it. Well, what else? Anything else kind of um, 
on the, the burners right now as it relates to our industry? Well, there are, there's, there's two. One is a more of a, a state issue for Ohio, which uh -huh. is uh, lowering the uh, LLC um, deduction level from $250,000 to $100,000 mm -hmm. and eliminating the cap on the tax. Mm -hmm. So that means if you have smaller properties, you have a 20 unit building, a 10 unit building, a 40 unit building, and the 40 unit might, depending on the level of your rents, cross the threshold. But that means that first 250,000, instead of, you've got another $150,000 worth of deductions you just lost. Right. And that's huge, because that's all now being taxed. And in some cases, we did a quick tally, and I was looking at a $40,000 tax increase. Wow. I only have 190 units, you're talking right. $40,000 increase in one year because of one deduction loss. Right. That's incredible. Wow. Um, so Where does that kind of stand right now? Um, it is in the Senate, and the Senate has said that they do not want a tax increase. Uh -huh. And I would consider a $40,000 tax increase a pretty substantial tax increase. Sure. Yeah. But so that's where we're engaging members to get involved with that and to call up and talk to their senator on that. Sure. Um, the other one, which is kind of a, a larger issue and one states are working on, and I know that the um, Housing and Urban Development is working on, is also companion animals. Oh yeah, that's a big one for sure. You know, <laughs> well, we mean I can't have my pet here. Oh, well, hold on, let me get a, a note handwritten by somebody. And buy and, something. <laughs> yeah, and, and it doesn't even have to be that much. Right. Um, I did have a, a kind of funny story. I talked to the um, attorney for HUD, uh -huh. who was actually working on his laptop doing research on this issue and he had so many pop-ups from all these internet sites saying hey we'll, we'll give it to you for 25 bucks right. 25 to 65 yeah. he said i actually had to have my laptop sent down to it to get the pop-ups taken off oh, because wow. it crashed his laptop oh my goodness like, welcome to our world yeah that's what we're <laughs> dealing with and yeah like, we hear your pain we're, we're gonna we'll see what we can do on this well and, and now like i just heard and I'm sure this will cross over into our industry at some point. I just heard an article, or read an article rather, um, that someone was bitten on an airplane by a companion animal, and now they're suing the airline. Correct. And so there's that kind of risk that inevitably is going to present itself to us. And, and the airlines have really been on the front kind of burner for this, uh -huh. whether it's the, the peacock with a nine-foot tail <laughs> walking down and right. you know, the airline saying, no. The owl, wasn't there an owl or there's something There's an owl, like that? there's yeah. a lady with a about a six foot albino um, python that she was walking on and the captain literally said, no snakes on a plane, no <laughs> snakes on a plane, you know, and, but they've been the one, and they've won those challenges. Right. And one of the difficulties we have is, well, that's their home. Yeah. And it's like, okay, yes, but <laughs> one of the difficulties is, I have somebody who's already living there who might be allergic. Sure. And so who's, Whose disability trumps whose disability? Right. And that's one of the questions we asked. And the the legal side of it and the attorneys all said, well, let the judges decide that. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but I'm paying for that. Right. Give us some bright line guidance on that. Right. So that if I have a resident who's allergic to dogs, whether you've got an ADA dog or not, you can't bring it in here. Right. Because they're already allergic to right. it. Right. And, and give us some bright lines like that. And they have not. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's a very touchy one and one that we deal with literally every single day. It so, is. well, listen, I'm sure we could talk all day, but it's Friday. You have your weekend to get to. I really appreciate you being here, Charles. Thank you so much Thank you for much, so taking this. time out. Um, it was great to get to know a little bit more about you. I feel now enlightened. I know what you are and what you are not, and <laughs> um, had the chance to pick your brain. Um, I would like to ask you one more question, then we'll wrap it up. So, what do you think? your colleagues who have worked with you either through the GCNKAA or this industry would say about you as a professional? Um, a couple of them have asked, so how do you stay so engaged after so long? So part of it, I became your member. Right. Once you start buying it on, you feel like this, this is really hitting me personally, it's right. not just a job. Right. And so you're more motivated on that side, but the, as I mentioned earlier, the breadth of knowledge and the depth of knowledge so that when it's a, a bed bug issue, a mold issue, right. when I've got my license on pest control to deal with a bed bug issue. Yeah. You know, there's, there's things like that that you just learn over the years from uh, smoke detectors and things like that. So I become a resource for the association nationally. Mm -hmm. And that's been, uh, that's been rewarding as well. Yeah. Very helpful. Well, that's certainly what I think of, you being a great resource for us. And I appreciate that and appreciate you representing us and being there for us anytime we have a crazy, I know I've been able to personally call on you for issues at Village Green and, and in our 
downtown properties specifically, and so I appreciate that you're always there for us when we need you. Like you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate you hanging out with us this Friday. We'll be back next week for another edition of the Weekly Member Spotlight, and I would be remiss if I didn't add again an invitation for anyone who wants to participate in this initiative. Give us a call. We will get you scheduled. I think we're through about September right now, so we've got a whole another quarter of the year to get scheduled out, so give us a call. We'll get you on there. Thanks so much.